Welcome to our live webcast, Untangling Amyloidosis. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mike, and I'll be the operator for the presentation today. Now, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. During this presentation, you will see the following multiple choice polling questions. To participate in the polls, please select the buttons just to the left of the answer that best represents your views or experiences. On the right-hand side of your screen, you see the text chat window. There's a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you can type in your questions. Send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When you're finished, click the send button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters, and your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed near the end of our presentation today. At the conclusion of today's program, we ask that you complete a brief post-event survey. Please take a moment to complete this survey as it will help Amyloidosis Foundation plan future web events. We are joined today by our speakers, Vishali Sancharawala, MD, a hematologist and director of the Boston University Boston Medical Center Amyloidosis Center, and Frederick L. Ruberg, MD, the senior cardiologist with the group. And before we begin our presentation today, we would like you to please respond to a few polling questions. So we'll start with this polling question in particular to get an idea of who's participating in our webinar today. If you would, please choose the response that best fits you. Are you a patient, family member, caregiver, physician, or other? And if, we, if you would, please respond to our polling question again to give us a better idea of, of who is connected to our event today. We'll give everyone a moment or two to make their responses. And it would appear as if the majority of the sites have responded to our initial polling question, and we do appreciate those responses as well. With that, we'll move on to an additional polling question that we'd like you to respond to as well. And again, that question reads as follows. If you are a patient, what type of amyloidosis do you have? Is it AL, ATTR, wild type, AA, or other? And we'll give you a moment or two to make a response as well to our second attend this, or a second uh, interactive polling question, rather. I'll give every site just a moment or two longer to make those final selections. Again, we appreciate your responses to our polling questions. And it would appear as if the majority of sites have made their final selection. And we, again, uh, appreciate all your responses to our polling questions. So at this time, we are ready to go ahead and begin our presentation. And uh, we'll go ahead and begin the presentation now. Good afternoon, members and guests of Amyloidosis Community. I begin by thanking the Amyloidosis Foundation and the sponsors for inviting me and Dr. Ruberg from the Amyloidosis Center at Boston University and Boston Medical Center. Dr. Ruberg and I will be speaking on Untangling Amyloidosis, a guide for patients and caregivers. These are my disclosures, and these are the disclosures for Dr. Ruberg. I begin by showing this cartoon as the average physician's approach to the patient with amyloidosis. A patient presents to his primary care physician with raccoon eyes and enlarged tongue, and the primary care physician tells him, there are some things they do not teach you in medical school. I think you've got one of those things. I hope none of you in the audience have experienced this. Austin Daily Texan newspaper reported in 2008 that the cause of death of most supercentenarians is TTR amyloidosis. This was after the death 
of Alberta Perkins at age 114. This is probably the wild type TTR amyloidosis that Dr. Ruberg is going to uh, tell us about. Amyloidosis Center at Boston University School of Medicine has been in existence for over 50 years. It has been an internationally recognized center of excellence and a global resource for physicians, researchers, patients, caregivers, and families. Founded in 1960s, primarily for research, the center has pioneered significant new treatments over the years and developed one of the largest clinical programs in the country devoted to the treatment of systemic amyloid diseases. Currently, we evaluate approximately 650 patients a year, and as expected, two-thirds of these patients have AL amyloidosis, 10 to 15 percent have familial or hereditary amyloidosis, and five are age-related wild-type TTR amyloidosis. The learning goals and outline of this webinar are shown here. I am going to focus on AL amyloidosis, or also now known as immunoglobulin light chain amyloidosis, and Dr. Ruberg is going to focus on transthyretin or TTR amyloidosis. Systemic amyloidosis are a term for diseases that share a common feature of extracellular, pathologic, insoluble fibrillary protein in various organs and tissues. The pathognomonic hallmark feature is misfolding of a soluble precursor protein that leads to cascade of events forming beta sheet pleated unparalleled fibrils. This structure of the fibrils gives rise to apple green birefringence when stained with Congo red dye and examined under polarized light microscopy as shown here in this slide. The Nomenclature Committee of the International Society of Amyloidosis has classified amyloidosis as either systemic form or localized form. Systemic amyloidosis is defined as deposition of amyloid fibrils occurring away from the site of production of the precursor protein. The most common form of systemic amyloidosis is AL amyloidosis, where amyloid fibril deposition occurs in various organs and tissues away from the site of precursor protein production, which is the plasma cells in the bone marrow. In contrast, localized amyloidosis is defined as deposition of amyloid fibrils occurring at the site of production of the precursor protein. The most common form of localized amyloidosis is Alzheimer's disease, where the amyloid fibril plaques are deposited in the brain at the site of precursor protein A beta, which also occurs in the brain. Molecular events that lead to amyloid fibrillogenesis are depicted in this cartoon. Pathogenesis of amyloid fibril formation begins with misfolding of a soluble precursor protein in the presence of either a mutation or a proteolytic event 
or excessive concentration that leads to formation of soluble toxic oligomers which interact with glycosaminoglycans and serum amyloid P protein to form the amyloid fibrils and then deposit. Organ dysfunction leading to clinical disease occurs because of toxicity of misfolded light chains, soluble aggregates, and or disruption of architecture of the tissues due to amyloid deposits. There are 36 different precursor proteins identified up to date causing amyloidosis. We will be focusing on light chain and transthyretin proteins which leads to AL amyloidosis and TTR amyloidosis respectively. AL amyloidosis is associated with a plasma cell dyscrasia and is a cousin of multiple myeloma, which is a plasma cell cancer. The precursor protein in AL amyloidosis is the light chain which or its fragment, which is secreted by the plasma cells, which are demonstrated here on the right panel in the bone marrow examination. AL amyloidosis is the most common type of systemic amyloidosis in the developed countries. The estimated incidence is 8 to 12 persons per million per year. 10 to 15% of cases of AL amyloidosis occur in conjunction with multiple myeloma. There are about 30 to 45,000 patients with AL amyloidosis living in the United States and Europe. Amyloidosis Research Consortium, a patient led group performed an online survey of 459 patients and caregivers with amyloidosis. To my surprise, one-third of the patients took more than 12 months from time of initial symptoms to diagnosis. Furthermore, one-third of patients visited more than five physicians before establishment of the diagnosis. This again indicates the need for improved awareness for early diagnosis. A physician should suspect amyloidosis when there is a clinical indication for multisystem disease, fatigue, leg swelling, exertional shortness of breath, dizziness with change in position, unexplained weight loss, enlarged liver, enlarged tongue, or raccoon eyes should lead a physician to suspect amyloidosis. Diagnosis of amyloidosis requires a two-step approach, high index of clinical suspicion and tissue diagnosis. Tissue diagnosis should be obtained by abdominal fat pad aspiration or by biopsy of the affected organ. Abdominal fat pad aspiration is an office procedure and is positive in 70% of cases. So if the fat pad aspiration is negative and clinical index of suspicion is high, one must perform an organ biopsy, either of the kidney or heart. Once tissue diagnosis is established, it is fundamental to identify precursor protein unequivocally in order to offer appropriate treatment, assess prognosis, and offer genetic counseling when appropriate. Identification of precursor protein can be done either via special staining of the tissue biopsy 
or by mass spectrometry, which is considered the gold standard in accurately establishing the correct typing. This slide demonstrates the components of multidisciplinary evaluation at Boston Medical Center. All patients are evaluated by different subspecialists, including nutritionists, clinical research nurse, and social worker. Evaluation at the multidisciplinary amyloidosis clinic lasts for two to three days, and a typical visit schedule is outlined here. All patients are discussed by members of the multidisciplinary team, and recommendations are then are given to patients and to referring physicians. Prognosis in AL amyloidosis is based on either the markers of the plasma cell dyscrasia or organ dysfunction. Significantly elevated serum-free light chain levels and bone marrow plasma cell count of greater than 10% constitute poor prognosis. Furthermore, Advanced organ dysfunction, as noted by elevated cardiac biomarkers, blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, renal failure, and poor functional status suggest poor prognosis and poor tolerability of treatment. Each step in pathogenesis could be a potential treatment target. Treatment has been focused on attacking the source of soluble precursor protein production, that is, the plasma cell dyscrasia. The two key elements to effective treatment in AL amyloidosis are early diagnosis and correct typing. Once the diagnosis of AL has been firmly established, the design of the therapeutic strategy is to target the plasma cell dyscrasia to slow or stop the precursor light chain production. Hematologic response is necessary for organ or clinical response. However, organ response may take up to 3 to 12 months after treatment to occur. Treatment for AL amyloidosis has been adapted from treatment of multiple myeloma. And the target has been the plasma cell dyscrasia in the bone marrow. The analogy that I would now use to describe the treatment of plasma cell dyscrasia is of a seed and soil. This slide highlights the treatment target of plasma, cell, plasma cells, which is the seed. Whereas the next slide highlights the treatment target of microenvironment of the plasma cells, which is the soil. Melphalan, melphalan in combination with stem cell transplant and other chemotherapeutic agents like bendamustine and novel monoclonal antibodies attack the seed or the plasma cells, and thereby stopping the production of the soluble precursor protein. This slide highlights the treatment target of microenvironment of the plasma cells, which is the soil. Immunomodulatory agents and proteasome inhibitors attack the microenvironment, making the soil unfriendly and hostile and thereby stopping the soluble precursor protein production. This slide demonstrates our experience of high-dose melphalan and autologous peripheral blood stem cell transplantation in 629 patients treated at Boston University from 1994 to 2014. The median overall survival was 7.6 years, and 30% of patients achieved a long-term survival of over 20 years. 
This slide demonstrates guidelines for initial treatment of newly diagnosed patients with AL amyloidosis. The first assessment should be if a patient is eligible to receive a stem cell transplant, and if not eligible, then treatment with Cybor D or melphalan and dexamethasone should be offered. The goal is to achieve a hematologic response. The therapeutic landscape of AL amyloidosis has expanded dramatically in the past decade due to discovery of novel agents, as shown on this slide. Therapies beyond the plasma cells are necessary to improve outcomes with respect to quality of life, functional status, and survival in patients with AL amyloidosis. This slide highlights the kinetics of organ or clinical response in AL amyloidosis. The median time to organ response from start of treatment was 10.4 months, and the median time to organ response after normalization of serum-free light chain ratio was 2.1 months. I now focus on promising emerging antifibril or amyloid-busting agents. Dr. Ruberg will also elucidate on these amyloid-busting agents briefly. EGCG, or a green tea extract, doxycycline, NEOD001, 11-1F4, and anti-serum amyloid T protein antibody are currently undergoing clinical investigation. Supportive care is a fundamental part of an integrated treatment approach to improve organ function, to maintain quality of life, and to prolong survival. It requires coordinated expertise of several subspecialists familiar with this disease. Salt restriction, careful administration of diuretics, avoidance of certain medications that are routinely used for congestive heart failure, and heroic measures like heart transplantation are the key players in management of advanced cardiac amyloidosis. Other supportive measures for postural hypotension and kidney involvement are listed here. Diarrhea from GI involvement and autonomic neuropathy can be treated with Imodium and Lomotil. Management of peripheral neuropathy should include gabapentin, duloxetine, and analgesics. In conclusion, treatment for amyloidosis is increasingly based on an understanding of the pathophysiology of the disease. These results and progress in the therapeutic landscape of systemic amyloidosis are unbelievable, unprecedented, unheard of for this uniformly fatal disease of the 1990s, but are not enough. In summary, take-home points, early diagnosis, high index of suspicion, and accurate typing are key components to design a treatment plan that includes best supportive care and treatment with participation in clinical trials will improve the outlook of patients with AL amyloidosis. And now I hand over to Dr. Ruberg to uh, uh, speak to you about TTR amyloidosis. Thank you very much, Dr. Santrawala. It is my pleasure now to uh, speak to the audience about ATTR amyloidosis. And um, as a disclaimer, I am a cardiologist, so I'll be focusing primarily on the cardiac manifestations of this very important disease with apologies to the neurologist listening or the patients um, with primarily neurologic symptoms. So this slide is a cartoon showing the tetrameric or protein form of ATTR. Now, ATTR is a protein synthesized by the liver that can be either genetically normal, and we call that wild type, or genetically mutated or um, abnormal, 
This constitutes the inherited form of the disease. The protein exists um, as four subunits, and it transports thyroid hormone and vitamin A. And there is a binding pocket here on the side in which certain agents, in this case, this cartoon illustrating the uh, um, therapeutic tefambidus that I'll speak about later, can fit into the protein and potentially stabilize it um, and inhibit its dissolution, as you can see here, into monomers um, that misfold, ultimately forming fibrils of amyloidosis. So the challenge is to stop this process from occurring. So the clinical features of ATTR cardiac amyloidosis are one of congestive heart failure primarily. And that is called cardiomyopathy in medical terms. The clinical symptomatology includes elevated JVP, which stands for jugular venous pressure. This indicates high pressures in the right side of the heart. Lower extremity edema, which indicates also high pressures in the right side of the heart, leading to fluid buildup and collection in the legs. And dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, indicating high pressures in the left side of the heart or fluid around the lungs related to congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure basically simply means that the heart can't pump blood and do its job with an adequate pressure. and It leads to this, this accumulation of fluid. Now, as you all probably know, amyloidosis also causes polyneuropathy. And as a non-neurologist, I won't be speaking in great detail about this, but you should know uh, that polyneuropathy is not typically associated with wild-type ATTR amyloidosis and also not commonly associated with ATTR B122I. Um, although reports have certainly uh, occurred. The neuropathy generally is a sensory polyneuropathy, meaning that uh, sensation is uh, either diminished or um, abnormal in the lower extremities, typically, um, or autonomic polyneuropathy, where re the regulation of blood pressure is abnormal. Now, this uh, speedometer-like cartoon that I like very much illustrates the different mutations, and they're all abbreviated here, from a range of a cardiac phenotype, in other words, the cardiomyopathy, to neurologic. And you can see that some mutations, like V122I, the mutation seen commonly in African Americans, um, is almost exclusively a cardiac manifestation, whereas V30M, the most common mutation worldwide, as I will speak about in future slides, is most commonly neurologic at early onset. And these all different, uh, different mutations have different manifestations. Why this occurs is one of the uh, great unanswered questions in this challenging disease. Now, I always um, think of amyloidosis as a zebra hiding in plain sight. And I like this slide because it basically shows you two zebras. In this case, this is uh, AL amyloidosis, and this represents TTR amyloidosis. Zebras are medical terms for things that doctors think are rare. Um, but in truth, actually, we're going to find, I think, that these are actually not as rare as we think, particularly in the case of ATTR amyloidosis. And physicians need to retrain themselves to see these, these diseases in the context of other more common things that we see every day. So how common is ATTR amyloidosis? Well, the uh, mutated form or the inherited form follow geography. And in certain parts of the world, it's actually quite common. The T60A mutation is seen in Northern Ireland. The V30M mutation is seen in these countries of the world, Portugal, Sweden, and Japan. And as I already mentioned, the V122I mutation is seen in US African Americans. In fact, 4% of African Americans carried this particular allele, which translates into a million people who actually have the mutation. We don't know how many of those people will ultimately develop uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy. That's the sub subject of, of investigation. Now, one thing you must know is that the inheritance pattern of these mutations is something called autosomal dominant. And that means there's a 50% chance of a child uh, inheriting the mutation from a parent. Wild-type TTR amyloidosis, on the other hand, is genetically normal. And we don't understand why um, people with normal TTR genetics develop this disease. It clearly has an age-dependent clinical penetrance, which is medical lingo for the older people get, the more likely they are to manifest the disease. Studies have shown that almost a quarter of patients over the age of 80 have amyloidosis in their hearts. And as Dr. Sancherwala mentioned, if we all live to 100, um, the majority of us will probably have some degree of amyloidosis in our hearts as well from ATTR. About 5 to 10 percent of people over the age of 65 with heart failure probably have some degree of amyloid in their hearts as well, as studies have shown. So this is probably an unrecognized uh, and important clinical disease. This is how we determine amyloid by histology. 
And Dr. Santuala already showed you this um, from a non-cardiac biopsy. And this is an example of a heart biopsy showing the characteristic Congo red staining here with green birefringence, that's the medical term, under a special kind of light, polarized light. This is the pathological diagnosis of amyloidosis. Now, we determine amyloid uh, cardiomyopathy, though, not always by histology. And in fact, histologic diagnosis is often not necessary in the case of ATTR amyloidosis, as I will tell you. This is an example of an echocardiogram. These are still frame images from a moving uh, echocardiogram showing two views of the same person's heart. This is a view called the parasternal long axis view. This is the, called the short axis view. And what you can see is that this heart muscle is very thickened. Each one of these lines here, from here to here, is one centimeter, and this heart is about twice that. This is normal thickness, and this is about twice normal. And this patient has ATTR amyloidosis, and I think you can see this here as well. This is a very thickened heart. Now, where this is a moving picture, you would see that the heart function is actually quite normal. It squeezes very well, but unfortunately, it does not relax normally, and that results in symptoms of congestive heart failure. One way in which we can identify amyloid cardiomyopathy, particularly at an earlier stage, is the use of something called strain. And your doctors uh, may be talking about this when you see patients. Strain is basically a way to look at the deformation of the heart in different orientations. A normal heart has strain that looks like this, where all the numbers are relatively the same and all the colors are the same. Whereas a patient with amyloid cardiomyopathy has differences in the strain here over the apex of the heart versus here, which is called the base of the heart, very different, and the, and the colors look different. And that indicates to a doctor that this patient could potentially have cardiac amyloidosis. So strain is another way that we can identify cardiac amyloidosis over and above that of wall thickness measures that I just showed you. In AL amyloidosis, we reported last year that strain could actually improve with treatments for AL amyloidosis for patients who achieve a complete hematologic response and the addition of strain to standard biomarker staging um, using things like DNP and troponin identifies patients who might be at the highest risk of, of doing poorly. Uh, and this is work that was um, also shown by our colleagues um, at the Mayo Clinic as well uh, with a different analysis. MRI is another way that we visualize the heart. And this is a still frame image from a moving MRI picture. And the advantage of MRI isn't so much that we can measure wall thickness very well, which we can, but the primary advantage is the ability to actually see the amyloid deposition in the heart by virtue of the fact that it increases the amount of fluid in the heart muscle. We call that the extracellular volume. And what we see are these bright signals here around the heart, here and here, and also here, indicative of cardiac amyloid amyloidosis. And when you see those bright signals, that really increases the likelihood that the patient has amyloidosis. And in this uh, summary of just a few studies from the uh, late 2000s, showing the sensitivity, specificity, this is positive predictive value and this is negative predictive value that a patient may have amyloidosis, the use of cardiac MRI is very good, not 100%, not 100%, but still very good to uh, help rule in or rule out amyloidosis. And so we're frequently seeing patients at our referral center now in which the cardiologist or the, uh, or the uh, oncologist has acquired an MRI, the MRI was abnormal in a pattern suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis, which is a, we call this a diffuse subendocardial or transmural pattern, and that prompts further evaluation. The other advantage of MRI is it provides insight into the um, continuum of uh, amyloid deposition. And using something called ECV calculation, which we can do by MRI, and LGE, which stands for late enhancement, we can look at the combination of these things and get a sense of how a patient can present from completely normal, no uh, late enhancement, no and normal ECV to, uh, to uh, through, I'm sorry, increasing ECV and increasing LGE, indicating different stages of disease. Now, whether a patient can go from here to here is not known. Um, we certainly know that patients go this direction if untreated, um, but but the possibility of being able to understand how patients might move through this continuum um, and, and, and the use of MRI to do this is really very exciting for future studies. Nuclear imaging has very much revolutionized the way in which we identify ATTR amyloidosis. And this slide here illustrates a number of different studies uh, performed both in Europe and the United States using these special tracers that identify ATTR amyloidosis selectively. In this case, this is a, 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 this is a figure showing both uh, DPD, which is a, a tracer used in Europe, and PYP, an agent here in the United States, 
in their capacity to differentiate AL from ATTR, either wild-type or mutant amyloidosis, using something called the heart-to-contralateral ratio, which is a ratio of the amount of um, tracer uptake in the heart versus the other side of the chest. You can also look at these images just visually, um, and this is um, a, a figure from a, a practice points document put out by the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, which very nicely summarizes the different uh, uh, uptake patterns seen in ATTR amyloidosis. Grade zero, where there's no uptake in the heart, um, is indicative of no amyloidosis. Grade one is considered indeterminate, and grade two and grade three seen here are considered diagnostic of ATTR amyloidosis in the right clinical setting. What is the right clinical setting? It's a setting in which patients have uptake but don't have any evidence of a plasma cell problem. So they don't have AL amyloidosis by blood testing, but they do have grade two or grade three uptake. And in a large consensus study that involved um, many specialists around the world and a very large population of patients, the conclusion was that the presence of either grade two or grade three uptake and the absence of um, of AL amyloidosis by blood testing conferred virtually 100% specificity uh, and 100% positive predictive value, meaning the test was extremely accurate and one could diagnose ATTR amyloidosis without the need for biopsy, without the need for heart biopsy, an invasive procedure that I showed you uh, a few slides ago. We also understand that standard biomarkers now confer, the, uh, confer risk, just as they do in AL amyloidosis. And this is a study from our colleagues at Mayo Clinic showing troponin T and NT-proBNP, troponin T seen here and NT-proBNP seen here, as a means to create a scoring system for ATTR wild-type amyloidosis. And the concept of this study is that using specific diagnostic thresholds seen here, if the, um, the, the uh, biomarkers are above threshold, then patients uh, are more likely to do worse than if they're below threshold. Um, and this is very helpful to establish um, a sense of uh, what to expect when seeing a patient for the first time in amyloidosis clinic. Now, you also must know that these are studies that don't involve any of the, the uh, clinical trials or treatments for ATTR amyloidosis that I'm about to speak about. So this can be seen as natural history, as illustrated in, um, in the title for this, uh, this slide. And so um, the landscape is changing dramatically, just as it is in AL amyloidosis. In ATTR amyloidosis, um, these, uh, these curves can be seen as the baseline for untreated patients. Um, but, uh, but things are changing quickly. We also are very interested in trying to understand new biomarkers, new, new uh, blood tests or indicators for disease activity in ATTR amyloidosis. And we recently reported um, earlier this year the potential utility of either um, uh, RBP4 concentration, which is a, a blood protein seen here, or TTR concentration, which is actual measuring the amount of TTR or prealbumin in the blood as a means to identify cardiac amyloidosis and in the context of other um, standard of care testing results, such as echocardiography and uh, ECG, a means to, pr to develop a point of care, meaning in the clinic, diagnostic test. We're moving towards this, and this is a screenshot from a, uh, a developed point of care diagnostic algorithm that we have created and we're in the process of validating, wherein a clinician can simply enter a couple of values seen here and then get a predictive likelihood that the patient has ATTR amyloidosis and whether or not further diagnostic testing should be performed. We hope that this test will someday increase the accuracy that clinicians might be able to identify amyloidosis more readily. How do we treat ATTR amyloidosis? Well, it used to be that all we could do was liver transplantation. And liver transplantation works for ATTR mutant and amyloidosis. It doesn't really work for ATTR wild type because the ATTR is normal. Um, and we could do cardiac transplantation as well, of course, um, but many patients who with ATTR wild type, for example, are of advanced age and are not eligible for uh, cardiac transplantation. So the world has basically coalesced around two very innovative treatment strategies, one of which involves stabilization of TTR. As I showed you in my very first slide, uh, agents that actually stop TTR from unfolding into amyloidosis or agents that actually suppress TTR expression. So in other words, they, they uh, induce the liver to stop making the offending TTR protein with the idea that the disease would stop progressing and potentially get better. Now, a number of companies have moved into the, into the spotlight in this, and one of them is the company Ionis, previously known as ISIS, which changed their name for obvious reasons. But they've been a pioneer in the antisense oligodeoxynucleotide approach, whereas alnylam pharmaceuticals, 
have been a pioneer in the RNA interference approach. These are two different techniques used to suppress TTR protein. They, along with Pfizer, which have developed the drug Tefamidus, seen here, which is a TTR stabilizer, have moved three agents into large-scale clinical trial to test efficacy. Um, and this busy slide basically shows you the three different agents seen in black that are actually clinically being tested right now. Um, all of these drugs um, are, are, have enrolled their clinical trials, and the results are not yet known, but we're hopeful soon that we will know uh, the final results. Um, and there are two agents that you can see in red crossout that unfortunately were developed but had adverse effects and were discontinued. So there is great hope that, that one or more of these agents will be, um, will be um, effective and be able to stop and bend the curve of, of TTR progression. Now, we already do have a drug that potentially could work, and this is called Diflunosol, which um, may also have been discussed um, by, with providers and patients. Diflunosol is a drug that um, is an old uh, agent that has been approved by the FDA. Now, it's a non-steroidal, which goes by the name Dolabid, and it, it, it works like ibuprofen. It was developed um, as a, as a non-steroidal agent to uh, treat pain and inflammation, um, but it was discovered um, by some very clever scientists that it can be repurposed and work as a TTR stabilizer. And at our center, John Burke led a clinical trial over a number of years that was funded by the federal government to look at the utility of this agent in ATTR amyloidosis with neuropathy primarily. And the dose you can see here is 250 milligrams twice daily. Now, as a, a non-steroidal, it has the side effects of kidney dysfunction and fluid retention, which is true for all non-steroidals. But these effects tend to be reversible if the drug is discontinued. Um, in our experience, this, this drug is uh, tolerated in about 30 to 50 percent of patients with cardiac involvement, certainly more with neurologic involvement. And safety data have been reported, although efficacy data in ATTR cardiac have not been reported. It was very effective in treating the neuropathy symptoms of ATTR amyloidosis. And so for this reason, uh, we are considering using this in patients uh, who are able to take it. What are future directions? Now, Dr. Sanchawala already touched on some of these. Um, there is great interest in the imaging of amyloidosis, and there are specific PET, which stands for positron emission tomography, PET agents that actually can identify amyloid directly. They were developed for Alzheimer's imaging, but it can be used in cardiac amyloidosis as well. And um, I'm citing here one clinical trial uh, run here in Boston um, that is looking at serial PET imaging to look for changes in deposition of amyloid for AL amyloidosis in this particular case, but it also works for ATTR. Um, and then there's the excitement about reabsorption. And Dr. Santrawala has already mentioned these. Um, uh, these agents, um, are some are specific for AL, um, but also TTR agents are being developed as well. And so this is a very exciting uh, also area where treatment may involve some combination of therapy involving stabilization, suppression, and or reabsorption. And finally, there are some potentially helpful but yet unproven in large clinical trial or even uh, a moderate-sized clinical trial um, applications, including the antibiotic doxycycline, which is a TTR, potentially TTR disruptor, or amyloid fibril disruptor, excuse me, and green tea, uh, the agent there is EGCG or TUDCA. All these agents potentially could be helpful. Uh, they all have varying degrees of side effects um, from virtually none in green tea to considerable side effects in doxycycline. Uh, mostly related to phototoxicity and some nausea. And um, this is a decision of the provider whether or not to prescribe these agents um, as they are yet unproven, but potentially could be so. So uh, for the patients listening, what can you do? Dr. Santrawala already mentioned uh, this um, to, to a great deal, but you can watch your sodium intake if you have cardiac amyloidosis and limit yourself if you can to 1.5 grams a day. You can watch your fluid intake to no more than two liters a day so you don't retain too much fluid. You can watch your weight, uh, and this means that you, keep, you should check your weight every day, and if you see yourself uh, uh, with gaining weight more than two pounds for two consecutive days, you should contact your doctor and potentially adjust your diuretic. You can watch your blood pressure, and if your blood pressure is low or very high, you can call your doctor, um, and you can watch for new symptoms. And above all, I think this is really what I want to say. Get to know your body and, um, and um, really pay attention to how you feel and let your doctor know. And any change in symptomatology could represent something that could be clinically important. Uh, and this is something that you would uh, discuss with your, your, your doctor. So in conclusion, again, reiterating many of the things Dr. Santrawala said, amyloidosis is becoming a treatable disease. And in the case of ATTR, is probably much more common than is presently appreciated. 
Dr. Santuwala has already shown you that treatments in AL are effective, and patients who can achieve uh, a complete hematologic response can live 15 or 20 years beyond treatment, as we have reported, and new treatments are being tested all the time. And in the case of ATTR amyloidosis, new agents that involve uh, TTR from progressing, TTR amyloid from progressing, that uh, involve either depression or stabilization or resorption are in testing now. And it might be way down the road that if we know people who are at risk for developing amyloidosis, we potentially could treat them with an agent that could protect them from ever developing the disease. Um, so for, for, for this reason, there are, there are these and others, there are many reasons to be very optimistic about this disease and, um, and I think also underscores why Dr. Santrawala, I, and all of the providers across the United States who take care of patients with amyloidosis are so passionate about, about treating this disease. So uh, I'd like to invite you to uh, visit our website um, listed here, which has information about amyloidosis, as well as um, some things that are happening here at Boston University, um, as well as, of course, the, the website of the Amyloidosis Foundation, which is very well developed and has references as well. Uh, and, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention um, and uh, look forward to any questions that you may have. All right, very well. We uh, thank our presenters for a terrific presentation. So as mentioned, it's time for your questions and answers to those. So as a reminder, text chat located on the right-hand side of your screen. To submit a question, type your question in the small text box at the bottom. When you're finished, click the Send button. Please note that due to time constraints, our panel may not be able to respond to all the questions submitted, but please keep those questions coming. With that, I'll turn things over to our panel of doctors to begin uh, addressing the questions we've received to this point. Thank you very much, Mike. So this is Rick Ruberg. And, uh, this is Vaishali Sanchuravala. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for uh, tuning in and listening to the webinar. Um, we see that there are 122 participants, and we, we thank you for spending some time in your afternoon with us and um, also for uh, sticking to the very end of the, of the, of the presentation. So what we're going to do is read, we have a number of questions, probably about 15 questions here, and we will um, take the questions each uh, as they're relevant to, uh, to our subject areas. And we'll read the questions and just identify the first name of the person, um, uh, and, uh, and that's where we'll go. So uh, I will start with the first question because it's to me from Doug. How effective are LVADs in improving life quality in ATTR uh, wild-type cardiac amyloidosis? And for not everybody who may not know, LVAD stands for Left Ventricular Assist Device, and this is a mechanical pump that's implanted in the chest of patients to help their hearts pump better. So in ATTR wild-type cardiac amyloidosis, there is um, a limited experience with LVADs, and in some patients, um, there has been some uh, improvement in their quality of life and extension of life to, to some degree. The problem is that um, many, in fact, most patients with ATTR uh, amyloidosis, uh, wild-type amyloidosis, have hearts that are sized in such a way that they don't accept the LVADs very well. They're basically, the LVADs are designed to work in hearts that are dilated and uh, weak, and in ATTR amyloidosis, the heart is not dilated, it actually tends to be a little bit smaller, and so technically it can be difficult to place the pumps. But um, in some people, they definitely are, are helpful. And in patients with what we call advanced heart failure, with symptoms that we can't really control very well uh, with medications, we do consider these, these pumps. The next question, um, I think Vaishali will take yeah. it. Is from ARC, I have nodular localized cutaneous amyloidosis. Are there any new treatments on the horizon for this condition? So nodular cutaneous amyloidosis is a localized form of amyloidosis. It involves only the skin, and there are no really treatments for this condition uh, except for maybe excision of the lesion. Generally speaking, this condition does not progress into systemic disease, and it does not involve any vital organs. Uh, so you know, the overall prognosis and outlook is very, very good for this condition. Next question uh, is from Linda. Uh, have you seen any correlation between any environmental or lifestyle that could cause the amyloidosis? Uh, and the answer is no, we have not. Uh, there have not been any uh, methodical epidemiological studies to really uh, assess uh, 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 you know, the correlation between environmental or lifestyle, uh, but, you know, there is no real uh, 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 correlation uh, noted. 
Okay, the next question is from Klaus. Uh, what is what what are your experiences with NEOD001 washing out amyloid deposits in muscles? So the answer is NEOD001 is an amyloid busting agent and it is an anti-fibril antibody uh, that uh, binds to the epitope in the uh, misfolded light chain. Um, the clinical trials that have been done have been done in patients with renal involvement, um, uh, with cardiac involvement, and with peripheral neuropathy. And we do know that uh, renal involvement, cardiac involvement, and peripheral neuropathy do get better with administration of NEOD001, but we do not know whether there is any effect in the muscles. Theoretically, it would have effect, and it would have the same beneficial effect in muscles as well. So the next question is from Clay, and it regards uh, whether, um, my, our opinion, whether RNA stabilization, and I think in this case we're talking about RNA interference, would be sufficient as a treatment approach for ATTR amyloidosis, and whether an antibody added in a cocktail will be required. And the, the kind of the, the uh, bottom line of the question is, if, AT, if TTR is lowered sufficiently by suppression of these new, new ag agents, um, can the body's natural clearance mechanisms clean out the deposits? That's the question. So this is a very interesting question. And um, as, as Clay has already recognized, suppressing TTR expression and getting rid of TTR in the blood, which is what the RNA uh, uh, interference approach or antisense oligodeoxynucleotide approach that I mentioned in the webinar accomplishes, doesn't reverse the process in the heart. It just stops it from getting worse. Um, and there is evidence in AL amyloidosis that if we stop the light chain production, there is some modest improvement in, in the thickness of the heart and in heart function, while there are dramatic improvements in the biomarkers of the heart that we look at that um, have information regarding prognosis. That evidence doesn't exist in, in TTR amyloidosis at the present time. So it's very likely, uh, or possible, I would say very possible and likely if the agents are effective, that we would, have, we would use a two-pronged two approach. One approach would be to stop the offending protein from being made. Um, in TTR, it would be using uh, RNAi or antisense uh, approach. Uh, and then we potentially would use another agent um, that could potentially try to remove the amyloid that was already deposited. Um, that's quite down the road because we need to demonstrate the efficacy of each of these agents individually. Um, but I can say that in AL amyloidosis and ATTR, a similar sort of uh, uh, kind of approach is being considered. Mm -hmm. So the next question is think, from Klaus. I was diagnosed with AL in 2012 and have been treated according to your advice. Kappa quite stable around 50, ratio of 1.5 and get Revlimid and Dex. So I'm not sure what the question here is, Klaus, but I think that, yes, 2012 you were diagnosed, 2017, I'm sure you've been treated with um, um, bortezomib or Velcade-based treatment, and now you're on Revlimid dexamethasone. That treatment really works uh, well. Uh, if you're tolerating it well, I would continue with the same treatment if your free light chain ratio is 1.5. Uh, Maria, for AL amyloidosis, could you restate again what MELDEX stands for? It stands for melphalan, oral melphalan. It is melphalan pills and dexamethasone, which is a type of steroids. So this is very widely used in European countries for patients who are not eligible for stem cell transplantation. The next question is from Jody, and the question is, why do doctors up north, where we happen to be now, seem to know more about amyloidosis than those in the south? Um, and also, the veterinarians in the south seem to be more familiar with amyloidosis. Well, I can't speak to the, sec the second point, because I'm not a veter veterinarian, and I don't know um, about amyloidosis affecting animals, um, but I certainly know a bit about humans, <laughs> I think. And um, I, I think the issue here really kind of comes to um, getting the message out, and it just so happens that the amyloidosis referral centers um, that have developed expertise are in the north, Mayo Clinic, Boston University, Columbia, Stanford, Cleveland Clinic, other places, um, you know, and I apologize if I've not mentioned others. Um, there are places in the south that are developing expertise, um, and um, those of us who take care of amyloid patients 
uh, travel around and give presentations, and um, and I think this is only a matter of time before um, it becomes more widely more widely known. And we have a number of patients in our center from the south, um, and the more that we uh, interact with their doctors, the more they become knowledgeable. Okay, the next question is from Vilma. With AL, should you request for Cyborg D as treatment option, or is bortezomib and dexamethasone sufficient? So, uh, again, there is no head-to-head -head comparison that has been done except for one trial between Cyborg D versus Velcade Dex or bortezomib dexamethasone, except for one trial which was presented as an abstract uh, at International Myeloma Workshop from, um, uh, from Greece, and there was no difference between hematologic response rate between Cyborg D and Velcade Dex. However, the phase two trials or the single arm trials were all for Cyborg D are pretty reasonably good. Uh, so I think that you know it is, it, you know it's not really he compared head to head in a um, you know in a control setting. Next question is from Maria. Um, what does EGCG? Uh, what uh, what dose is appropriate and can you take it in capsules? So EGCG is a uh, is the active agent in green tea that has been shown in uh, laboratory studies to disrupt amyloid fibril formation, um, and um, it's currently being uh, tested uh, and also being taken um, by patients and, and recommended by doctors, including our own center, for patients with TTR amyloidosis. The dose is 500 milligrams a day. Um, you would have to drink a lot of green tea to achieve that level. Um, but we, uh, I mean, as, as, a, as a program, our position is that it is, has vir virtually no risk. It's, it's, there's, there's no harm in taking it. Some of the capsules have caffeine and you have to bear that in mind, so you should probably check the caffeine content. Um, but um, the benefits have not been uh, definitively shown. Um, some, some studies have shown some improvement in, in heart size. Um, and uh, and there are many um, people. There are a number of people who believe strongly that it works. Um, and so, because it's possible that it could be effective and the risk is low, our center um, is recommending it for TTR patients. Next question is from Wilma. Uh, after two and a half years of uh, CR, numbers increase, therefore requiring more treatment. Is this normal, or how long should you do chemo treatment? you should do chemo treatments till you achieve a complete hematologic response or till progression of disease or till development of toxicity. Next question is from Karen. ATTR and AL uh, cardiac amyloidosis question. When AL deposits in the heart, uh, are symptoms the same as ATTR and will the echo look the same with thickness um, and the color change that I showed? So um, that's a good question. They both um, lead to similar features, including basically including increased wall thickness and that color change that I showed you, um, which represents um, a difference in the apical, apical part of the heart and the basal part of the heart in this parameter called strain. Generally speaking, ATTR amyloidosis tends to have thicker hearts uh, with lower heart function, um, but there is sufficient overlap, and so it's, it's not possible to look at an echocardiogram and definitively know what type of amyloid um, somebody has. Next question is from, for, from Wilma, uh, and I think it's about organ response. The, fo the following soft tissue has been compromised with no improvement after first line of treatment two and a half years later. My GI, tongue, raccoon eye, skin, nails, itching, bruising, shortness of breath, uh, difficulty swallowing. Should you ask for longer or change of treatment options? Again, you know, I think the whole goal of treatment in AL amyloidosis is to attack the plasma cell dyscrasia or the factory where the precursor protein is being produced. So I would like to know from Wilma if you are still in hematologic remission, uh, the organs are supposed to get better, but they don't always get better because we are not attacking that part of the pathophysiology, pathogenesis of AL amyloidosis. Antifibril agents would be attacking the already deposited fibrils and already deposited amyloid, uh, but you know those are not yet FDA approved and are not available. Next question is from Karen. How common is arrhythmia in AL patients with cardiac involvement? Uh, the most common heart rhythm disturbance in, in AL patients 
uh, with cardiac amyloidosis is atrial fibrillation. But even then, it's relatively uncommon on the order of uh, 10 to 20 percent, depending upon what series you look at. Um, that would be the most common arrhythmia. More significant ventricular arrhythmias that can um, can be uh, concerning um, that that, that uh, could lead to uh, loss of consciousness or other sorts of more serious problems or tend to be much rarer and, and less common, fortunately. Next patient is from uh, Allison. Uh, how many cases of ATTR cardiomyopathy are identified at your center each year? Um, ATTR wild type or ATTRM? Uh, ATTRM, um, I think, is probably less common. We'd have to, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I'd say somewhere between probably 15 to 30 patients of ATTRM cardiomyopathy. And wild type, I would say somewhere between 25 to 50, mm -hmm. maybe closer to 50 new cases of ATTR wild type cardiomyopathy seen at our center per year. Remember, we're not seeing those patients all here at Boston Medical Center, Boston University. These patients are being referred to us from um, all over the United States. The next question is from Elaine. Uh, what is the quality of life after stem cell transplantation? The quality of life is much improved, and this has been shown by SF36 forms, which is a quality of life tool after stem cell transplant, physical component summary, and mental component summary. Both are much uh, improved after stem cell transplantation. Uh, yeah. Next question from John. I have ATTR, and I'm trying to decide between going between Boston and Mayo. Um, <laughs> Well, you, <laughs> yeah, from Boston. <laughs> you can't go wrong. You, you can't go wrong. Yeah. I think um, I would say would really uh, the, the the best answer for you might be what's most convenient for you, and um, I think that uh, depends on where you live and what your insurance covers, and and that that's. But I, I think that you know either either place um, you're going to get excellent care and um, have the same access to the same clinical trials um, that 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 that, uh, that that each place offers. Um, okay, the next question is uh, just an encouragement. We thank you for, from Robert, thank you for, uh, for listening in. We're, we're pleased that you enjoyed the, the presentation. Okay, so next question would be for me, Joan. What percent of patients with AL amyloidosis and advanced cardiac involvement at diagnosis survive greater than 10 years after achieving CR within one year of treatment? Well, that's a challenging, that's a challenging question because uh, there's a lot of conditions there. So basically, AL amyloidosis, cardiac involvement, who are eligible for, um, oh no, not, not stem cell, who just achieved CR. Um, well, the, the literature, and Vaishali can, can mm -hmm. jump in too, um, the literature suggests that if you can achieve a complete response, it doesn't really matter how you get there, it's just as long as you get there. And uh, achievement of CR um, is, is uh, obviously the goal. Survival of more than 10 years um, in our series with cardiac, maybe 30%. Is that good? Right. So, again, you know, our series is mainly with stem cell transplant. So, you know, the hematologic remissions achieved by stem cell transplantation are very, very durable. And therefore, you know, that 30% 30, 30 of patients live greater than 20 years. Um, whereas, you know, again, I think it also depends on how you've achieved the hematologic CR, you know, whether it is with Cyborg-D, whether it is with stem cell transplant. The track record for Cyborg-D or Velcade dex we don't have that long-term survival data on those regimens yet. Uh, but I would, I would say, you know, if, if you maintain a CR, that's, that's a very encouraging yeah. finding, right. and we have patients who are 15 to 20 years beyond uh, transplantation yeah. who have achieved CR with cardiac involvement. Next question from Doug, what is the endpoint for the Doxy-Tudka trial um, and its preliminary results? This trial is actually uh, was run here in Boston out of uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. I believe the end, I, I'm not part of that trial, neither of us are. I believe the, that was run by Rodney Falk. I believe the, uh, the endpoints were echocardiographic and I do not know if they have been published yet. I don't think they have. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, I cannot comment on the preliminary results. Um, are there, next question from George, are there clinical trials for wild type patients upcoming? So as George knows, um, presently there, there are no open clinical trials for wild type patients, but um, there probably will be in the future. GSK is developing an agent um, that uh, is an antibody um, approach uh, that, that potentially will be open for clinical trial. Um, the, uh, I, I don't, uh, since I, I'm not, I don't know whether, um, Al Nylum, which had developed an RNAi interference approach, um, which um, they're reporting data now in neuropathy, uh, whether they will um, they will con consider another trial in cardiomyopathy. Um, but uh, I think that there, are the, I think there's 
you know, great reason for optimism because there are so many different strategies that appear to be um, appear to be effective, at least in preliminary observation. So the answer is now there isn't anything, but I think uh, I hope in the next couple of years there'll be there'll be open clinical trials. Next question is from Ben. Does it seem to you that the monoclonal antibody drugs coming out of trials will stand alone as a treatment one day, or do they work best after the amyloid source has been shut down through stem cell transplant or chemotherapy? I think it would depend on the results of these clinical trials, the pronto and vital, and uh, you know it will also depend on the FDA approval. Uh, but I think combining the two of the the chemotherapy or the uh, agent directed towards plasma cell dyscrasia and the amyloid busting agent makes theoretical sense. Next question from Rob. Is heart transplant a consideration before production of, uh, of folding, folded proteins is terminated? And the answer to that is yes in AL amyloidosis. For patients who um, are um, not eligible for stem cell transplantation in our institution who are young and have uh, relatively uh, cardiac restricted disease and no significant comorbidities. I know it's a lot of a lot of conditions. We do consider cardiac transplantation, and um, and we um, our colleagues at Mass General have reported this. Um, so it's definitely a consideration in AL amyloidosis. Um, it's uh, it's for, for TTR amyloidosis um, for wild type um, transplantation. It's not it's not curative, but it's ostensibly curative because you basically the, the the amyloid certainly could deposit over time, but it's unlikely to um, to do so in the in the um, you know the 20 or so years after transplant that most people most people live. Um, and for mutant amyloidosis, it would be a combination of a, a, probably a stabilizer agent, which efficacy needs to be shown as we've talked about, uh, and transplant. But um, but cardiac transplant is definitely an option for people with advanced heart failure. Um, Next, Next question. question is from Andy. My father was diagnosed with cardiac AL amyloidosis. He's recommended to do Cyborg-D before stem cell transplant, but your slide recommended stem cell transplant first. Is he doing things backwards? So again, the role of induction therapy in patients with AL amyloidosis is controversial. Uh, we at Boston University do not recommend induction therapy with Cyborg-D or Valcade dexamethasone before stem cell transplant. Uh, if he's eligible to receive stem cell transplant, our uh, approach is to proceed with stem cell transplant uh, directly unless there is a clinical trial that he's participating in. Next question, Barry, how does someone obtain diflunosol? That's actually quite easy. Diflunosol is um, uh, a, uh, a prescribable by your primary care provider or any physician. Um, and um, all you need to do is request a prescription. And as I mentioned in my slide, uh, renal, uh, sorry, kidney function monitoring is important, and also taking precautions against uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, so, but I would talk with your 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 physician and make sure that that he or she feels that you are um, someone that could take diflunosol and and um, and and uh, tolerate it well. Uh, next uh, question is from Hannah. AL patient last FLC test showed normal free light chains and ratio. I'm in remission. So congratulations, Hannah. Uh, next question uh, from John. I had an MRI biopsy and echo. Will all these be re retested when I come to Boston? Well, John, we look forward to meeting you. Um, you will definitely have an echocardiogram when you come here. Um, you will not have a biopsy. Most you'll, You may have a bone marrow biopsy. We don't know what type of amyloid you have um, based upon your question. You will probably not have a repeat cardiac MRI. Um, the MRI um, in our kind of in our use is very good for identifying who does and who doesn't have disease. Um, and right now we don't have any ongoing MRI uh, clinical trials. So the likelihood is you'll have an echocardiogram of those that you asked. Uh, question from Brian. My wife had enlarged tongue in 2009 and it cured with steroids, but she developed amyloid and passed due to lack of recognition in our hospital. Do you think the stored biopsy from 2009 would test now for amyloid presence to assist future diagnosis due to enlarged tongue? Yes, the biopsy probably in 2009 was positive for Congo red and amyloid. Uh, Jane, question from Jane, are there any studies in how long Revlimid has been used successfully in AL amyloidosis? So yes, in our paper that we published in blood, uh, yes, we have used it for um, I think the longest we have used it is for about four and a half to five years. 
Question from Kenneth. Is the three-day evaluation for TTR familial amyloidosis the same as for AL? Um, no, they're not exactly the same. We do some different testing for TTR amyloid that we do for AL. AL patients get bone marrow biopsies, TTR patients don't. Um, TTR patients tend to get exercise tests, um, AL patients don't. Um, uh, you may uh, see a neurologist uh, with either disease. You may see a nephrologist with either disease. Um, so the, the amyloidosis evaluation is tailored to you. Well, actually, the way it works here at Boston is that Dr. Sanchewala will review all of your clinical data, as well as Dr. Burke, one of our other clinical, uh, cardi one of our clinical uh, experts, and then um, specific testing is recommended that, is, that you would need, um, and um, no more or no less. Um, so Todd is the next person. I saw one of the possible suggestions for treatment could be green tea. Could an alkaline environment assist in dissolving the amyloid? Oh, we don't know. I don't think we know the yeah, answer to that yeah. question. Interesting yeah. question. Todd right. sounds like a chemist, but we don't. Yes. <laughs> but we, we don't know. Mm -hmm. oh. Are you familiar okay. with that? No. So the next question is from Maria about using Zenpep for improving digestion for GI amyloidosis. No, I'm not sure. I'm sure the gastroenterology folks in our multidisciplinary team would know that. Um, Okay, so next question is from uh, Mr. Foss. I have been told that due to my age 74, I would not be considered for stem cell transplant. Do you agree? Uh, again, it's not in the chronological age, it's in your biological age, and if you are eligible for meeting other criteria for stem cell transplant, we would consider you. However, you know, we have transplanted patients up to 80 years of age, and you know, again, it's not about your age, it's about how functional you are and what other comorbidities you have. Donald asks, how important is exercise? Um, uh, I think we think exercise is very important. Uh, I think it's, as Dr. Sanchewala just said, a patient's uh, functional capacity and performance status, those are medical terms, are directly correlated to his or her ability to um, tolerate stem cell transplantation and do well. Um, and, um, and so, and as far as the heart's concerned, exercise is excellent. Um, it has to be done, obviously, in a, in a, a careful manner, um, but, I, uh, but I always encourage my patients to exercise uh, to a degree that they feel they're capable of doing so. Uh, the next question is from uh, Rick. Uh, I, I had my stem cell transplant in 2017, June, with a good partial response. What are June 2nd, so that's tomorrow, like, that's impossible. We know. I know, Rick. We know, we, we know Rick. <laughs> Mr. Slack. <laughs> With a good partial response, what are the stats or chance of moving to a complete response after one year? So the chances, so we do see that uh, on and off, uh, but in a very small percentage of patients that, uh, you know, it does, you know, at six months you could be, have a very good partial response or a partial response that could convert into complete response at one year, but it is in a small percentage of patients. Um, Next question is from Chris. I see that the Veterans Administration recognizes a possible link between herbicides and ALM. Are you familiar with this? Can you comment? So Agent Orange, I think uh, VA has, uh, you know, I think that there is a recognition of Agent Orange exposure and development of ALM amyloidosis. Next question from Jason. Uh, uh, Jason asks, what BNP and troponin can tell a person about their heart? Um, and what advances are being made with the drugs that can reverse the condition of the heart with cardiac amyloidosis. BNP and troponin are, are indispens indispensable in AL amyloidosis. They have information that help identify who has cardiac involvement and also provide information for prognosis and also are used to follow response to therapy. And so th those blood tests are, are really now, um, I would say, um, they're, they're in indispensable and acquired at every evaluation. And the other, the second part of your question, I think we have we've covered earlier in the webinar um, about the different drugs that potentially can can help the uh, amyloid. Uh, next question is from Jan. Is there any updates for AA amyloidosis? Uh, the update is that uh, only the, the, the Fibrilex or Kayacta was proven in a uh, phase three randomized clinical trial not to be effective. Uh, so that did not meet the endpoints and that trial was closed. There are no other treatments in the horizon for AA amyloidosis, unfortunately. Um, okay, so next question is from Charlotta, what are the best treatment centers in the South? 
what are the advantages and disadvantages of a stem cell transplant for a patient with AL amyloidosis. So the advantages are that it's a one-shot deal, that you know it is a very intense treatment, but it is a one-shot deal. You are not well for first three months after stem cell transplant, but then generally speaking after that, uh, things do improve. The question is whether you are eligible or not eligible to really receive stem cell transplant. Um, and what centers, best treatment centers in the South? Uh, you know, Vanderbilt has a amyloid a multidisciplinary team. Um, there are other university academic centers where also amyloid, you know, Mayo Clinic Jacksonville also has uh, an amyloidosis multidisciplinary team. So I think, you know, uh, there are some centers in the South which are gaining the experience. Uh, okay, uh, next question is from Mark. Do you do we have any updates on the clinical trials for NEOD001? Any chance it could be available for widespread use in the near future? I think the trials are going to read out in spring of 2018, and I'm sure, you know, that, uh, you know, they will be at FDA by then. Nancy asked, how do we get thiflunosol? Um I think we, we uh, addressed that point already. Ask your physician and make sure you're, you're able to, to take the drug based upon your renal function. Next question is from Mark. How do you how how to decide to use Velcate based or Revlimid based treat regimen? Uh, have they replaced melphalan prednisone based regimen? So I think a Velcate based treatment. I think Velcate works very quickly. It is uh, you know we would not use it in patients with neuropathy. We would not use it in patients with significant autonomic neuropathy. Revlimid works a little bit slower than Velcate. The median time to response with Revlimid is about six months, and patients who have uh, you know, uh, history of uh, thromboembolic complications, deep venous thrombosis, or blood clotting disorders, Revlimid is not recommended, um, and melphalan prednisone is not being used anymore. Next question from Barb. Um, I have AL with cardiac involvement. Why do you recommend not taking beta blockers? And the reason why is because beta blockers um, slow the heart rate down, and they um, and they also can negatively um, affect the squeezing of the heart to a more modest degree. And patients with AL amyloidosis tend to be very sensitive to those sorts of manipulations that a, that a person without AL, AL amyloid wouldn't really feel. And so, um, so a kind of a classic uh, presentation of a patient with cardiac amyloidosis medically is someone who a doctor started on a beta blocker but then got very, very tired and had a very low blood pressure. Next question is from Maria about Jalsolin amyloidosis that, uh, you know, her husband is diagnosed with it and his major symptom is fatigue and it is quite debilitating. Now, Jalsolin mutation is usually it involves the cranial nerves and the, uh, the facial uh, nerves, you know, so, you know, I'm not sure, you know, why uh, the fatigue should be a major part of this, but not I'm not an expert in gelsolin amyloidosis, so not sure. And it's not the same as uh, TTR amyloidosis. It's a different protein. Um, very gelsolin is much more uncommon. Mm -hmm. Next question uh, post do, from Lorena: Do you have any comment about post liver transplantation deposits of TTR in the heart? So this is an interesting question. There is um, pretty well established evidence that after liver transplantation, TTR amyloidosis. Can, even though the liver is now making uh, normal TTR protein, can still deposit in the heart if there has been previous deposition, and that process is called templating. And so for this reason, liver transplantation alone in somebody with cardiac amyloidosis, uh, hereditary amyloidosis, as, you're, as you were talking about, they're the only ones we would transplant, um, are, uh, are, are, um, liver transplant alone is not, is not effective. Uh, Clay asks, EGCG was paired with Tudka. Are these taken together? Yes, you can do that. Um, uh, you can definitely do that. I think our, we're, we recommend EGCG alone because it's better tolerated, um, has fewer side effects. Um, I believe that Mayo Clinic is also recommending Tudka as, uh, or um, Ursodiol, which is uh, available in the United States. Um, uh, I think there's no clear answer about the right thing to do. Um, and it's just a question of what the least side effects are and potential benefits. So this is a question from Jane uh, about asking about online forum for patients and caregivers to share stories and other support. Um, she is currently participating with Facebook group. So there is Amyloidosis Foundation and Amyloidosis Support Group uh, uh, patient stories and also um, uh, online uh, you know, support groups. So, yes, absolutely. 
uh, Catherine is asking a question. She was treated in 2013 with uh, Velcade and dexamethasone for five months. She currently is taking only Velcade low-dose aspirin. Are AL amyloidosis patients more prone to getting shingles? I have been in remission after one month of treatment. Is valcyclovir, I'm sorry, it's, I think she meant uh, valcyclovir, is something I would take forever. So Velcade is a uh, chemotherapeutic agent that can cause reactivation of shingles or herpes zoster in about 20 to 25% of patients. So it is recommended to take Valtrex or Valcyclovir, which is an antibiotic to suppress the herpes zoster virus. Usually the recommendations are to continue Valtrex for, uh, uh, while you are on treatment with Velcade and then maybe continue it for a, a month or two after stopping Velcade, but you should not remain on it forever. Uh, Art has uh, the Art is asking a question, saying that the nodular localized cutaneous amyloidosis on my nose continues to widen. Treatment has included laser shaving with a knife, corticosteroid injections, radiation. Should I expect it to continue to spread, or does it typically stop growing at some point? Right. It's it's you know again this is a very unusual case, and generally speaking, the cutaneous amyloidosis. D- you know, do not spread, but can spread in about 17% of patients, a large series reported by Mayo Clinic recently. So it will never become systemic, but it could spread in 17% of patients. Uh, Robert asks, I was diagnosed in 2016 with wild-type amyloidosis, um, and um, what's the predicted survival for this type of amyloidosis? So the median survival with ATTR wild-type um, depends really upon the age of diagnosis. In our center, a center uh, experience uh, group, uh, a publication from London, um, the median survival was two and a half to three years um, without any disease-modifying treatment. So that, that would be considered the natural history. A recent publication um, from a group in Italy and in um, Spain uh, suggested that the median survival was longer um, on the order of uh, five years. and that had to do with the fact that many of those patients were diagnosed at earlier stage. So I think the key is that um, we try to diagnose people earlier, um, but, uh, but, the, but the overall median expectation is about, about three years after diagnosis. Uh, Shamika has a question that she was diagnosed at age 33 with AL amyloidosis with cardiac involvement, was treated with Velcade, and she's now 40, and she has she's experiencing a relapse, and whether there's a role for stem cell transplant as a second-line treatment. If your heart can handle it, yes, there's a role for second-line treatment. And do, the, do, does the heart improve after stem cell transplant? I think heart will improve if you achieve a complete hematologic response. It may not happen overnight, but it may take about six months to 12 months before it improves. This is the gel, this is the gel solon uh, question. Yeah, about the fatigue and shortness of breath. Um, yeah, th- this is Maria asking a question yes. again about about the, the the patient with a gel solon mutation. I think that um, again we we uh, based upon the type of amyloidosis, we can't explain these symptoms without um, actually evaluating. Um, in person, and so I think I'd recommend that you you have that done uh, to try to figure out what the symptoms are. Right. Okay, this is a good question. Uh, David, question is from David. How many uh, AL patients go through a second stem cell transplant and is it effective? So uh, it depends what you mean by second stem cell transplant. Is it, if we did have a clinical trial where we did it in a tandem fashion, meaning that if you did not achieve a hematologic CR after first one, within six months of the first stem cell transplant, uh, patients received a second stem cell transplant. And that was feasible, tolerable, without any significant increase in morbidity or mortality, and the response rates were very high. However, if you are recommending a second stem cell transplant uh, after achieving a hematologic response after a first transplant and then relapse several years later, we also have reported that one-third of the patients would go back into hematologic responses, and including CRs. The second transplant, if it is done five years down the road, ten years down the road, it is a little bit tougher on the patients. I think in uh, just for a time check-in, we probably have in the order of five minutes left. Uh, we're being we're being no- messaged. We'll try to keep going through the questions. Gina asks, are any of the therapies um, uh, that we discussed for ATTR amyloidosis currently under 
uh, uh, review at FDA. Um, I can't comment on that. I don't know the answer, uh, and I don't know where they are in regulatory, uh, the regulatory process. Uh, that's not a question. Um, can do that. Uh, Vilma is asking, what is the overall survival for AL amyloidosis? I think it depends on the treatment. If you do achieve a hematologic CR after stem cell transplant, the hematologic CR is um, you know, median overall survival is greater than 10, 12 years. Uh, overall hematologic, C, uh, overall survival after stem cell transplant is uh, 7.6 years. But in other, uh, with other treatments, the survivals are different. Kenneth asks, uh, has diet and exercise shown any effect on the quality of life for individuals with amyloidosis? Um, I would say uh, no evidence. Right. We don't know. Um, but I think that um, eating a healthy diet and exercising regularly improves people's energy level um, <clears throat> anecdotally. Um, so I think that it's certainly probably is beneficial. It's not going to make the amyloidosis go away. You can't treat this disease with diet and exercise, but you certainly can make uh, people feel better. But there have been no sh studies showing changes in quality of life measures um, with exercise and diet. Chris is asking if there are fibril dissolving enzymes on the market. Do you think these are worth considering for amyloidosis fibrils? Uh, not known. Um, Wilma, overall survival without transplantation for AL amyloidosis depends on the type of treatment, but uh, with MALDEX, it is, in, um, it is again median overall survival is about six to seven years, and with Cyborg D, uh, uh, it is, I think, in the range of about three to four years. Leo, I have very good partial hematologic response after nine months of Belkid and DEX, what signs should be looking for that indicate continued improvement or conversely regression? Um, you know, I think your doctor should be able to follow your serum-free light chain assays. I would say that it should be done. Um, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So, you know, we, we, we should be following your serum-free light chain assays every three to the, two to three months to make sure that it's, you're not relapsing. Uh, Rob, AL patient, what are requirements for stem cell transplant in USA? In France, no one has mentioned this. I have just started chemo in cycle two. So the requirements for stem cell transplant are uh, variable as per the centers and the experience and the expertise of the treating physicians. Um, so, you know, each center has different stem cell transplant experience, uh, uh, eligibility criteria. At Boston University, our criteria are quite liberal. Uh, if, you know, it, you know, it all depends on the, um, uh, the severity of heart involvement and your functional status. Leo is asking if doxycycline is such an innocent innocuous treatment, why not use it regularly to obtain possible beneficial outcomes? Doxycycline, I think you have to be careful because it can cause significant GI toxicities as well as photosensitivity. So it's not, and its role, we really don't know whether it does have effect in animal models. We are not really convinced that in patients whether it has effect or not. Karen asks, um, are there any results from a Holter monitor, which is a 24-hour heart monitor, that could indicate cardiac involvement in an AL patient? Um, the answer is nothing diagnostic. Um, Holter monitors could be completely normal in AL amyloidosis. They could also show arrhythmia, um, and so it's not particularly, uh, unlike other um, cardiomyopathies or heart, heart problems, um, Holter monitors are not particularly useful in the absence of symptoms. If someone has palpitations, we often get them. Uh, and then sometimes they can they can provide the right answer. We have uh, time for only one more question. Um, Let's see. We're just going to look through here and. I think the questions keep coming in. Unfortunately, we wish we could answer all of them. Um, I think. Um, you know, Leo is asking, can you have more than one type of amyloidosis? Uh, it is rare to have one more than one type of amyloidosis, but yes, if you've had AL amyloidosis and if you are in remission for a long, long time and now you are above age 70, 75, there is always the risk that, you know, you could develop wild-type TTR if, you know, you continue to have. But this, again, requires very, very specialized expertise and care. So, um I think that, okay, so we're getting a message now that we should make closing comments. So um, we are sorry that we can't get through all the questions. These are excellent questions, and um, it's really a, a delight for us to be able to speak directly to 
to patients and to caregivers um, to try to answer these questions. Um, uh, we uh, we are always a resource here at Boston University. We have uh, you can go to our website. There's a way to submit uh, submit questions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well, um, which we will try to answer to the best of our ability. We're also available here, obviously, to see patients in referral for those of you who have not been seen here. Um, uh, from from my standpoint, I can say uh, that it is a absolute pleasure to take care of patients with amyloidosis, um, both uh, from a personal standpoint, but also. Um, just because um, I feel we're at the cusp of making great um, uh, transitions in, in the care of these patients to creating something uh, that used to be uh, a disease, either A or ATTR, that in invariably resulted in a patient's death to something that could become a chronic disease, um, much like um, HIV was in the early uh, mid-1980s with the development of new drugs. So it's a really exciting time, and there's great interest in, in, um, in you know, in the in the community, both pharmaceutical and the and the uh, people who do research in this area, like us, to to really uh, to make changes for people in a real very real level. So, what you think? All right, and I think we remain available. Just visit our website bu.edu/amyloid, uh, and you know you have all the resources and information on that website. Um, uh, you know, this was a pleasure. I thank Amyloidosis Foundation and the sponsors to make this happen. This is, uh, you know, it is very, very impressive. And, you know, it was very well done. Thank you to Kelly and Mike for, uh, you know, taking us through this. So thank you for, uh, thank you uh, everyone for joining us. And uh, we remain available for any questions. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. And thanks so much to uh, both of our presenters today for a terrific presentation. On behalf of the Amyloidosis Foundation, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. Post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. If you would please take a moment to complete this survey as it will help the Amyloidosis Foundation plan future web events. Also, you can check on the Amyloidosis website for a link to the recording of this presentation. That should appear there within a few days. Again, this concludes today's program. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.